you're here to see IT and the search for the Faculty Holy Grail. Um, this is meant to be a conversation, so I'm going to ask you to please think about your own personal experiences and thoughts as we move forward through this conversation, not so much a presentation. I'm Dina Kurzweil. I'm the director of the Education and Technology Innovation Support Office at the Uniform Services University. Over here to my left is Sean Baker. <laughs> and Sean, I don't even know your new title. Chief Technology Officer. Chief Technology Officer at the Uniform Services University of the Health Sciences. In front of me up here is Mr. Brandon Henry. He is an instructional designer at the university. And Beth Marcellus. The four of us work for the government, so a wonderful disclaimer must go on all our slides. So please note that these are our opinions and are not ones that are supposed to be construed as reflecting the views of the DOD, USIS, or any other agency of the federal government. So please keep that in mind. So we are here to talk about the faculty grail and the IT faculty grail. I have to ask an important question here as we start. How many people have actually seen the movie? It is important as part of this conversation that you think about the movie as we go through. So as we think about the cast of characters here, it's important for us to think about our own cast. Who works for us? What are they able to do? And we need to be sure that they are much more confident than we actually saw in the movie. We need to be sure they're well-rounded. We need to be sure they not only know IT elements, but things like customer service. They have to be well-trained, well-educated. They have to have an understanding of each other's strengths and weaknesses. And they can't just be a bunch of flubbering people that run around from problem to problem to problem. So one of the things I wanted to ask this group is how do you help your IT team actually understand each other's strengths and weaknesses. You know, I know in my group we have a lot of conversations with each other about what we're learning, what we're able to do, and how we're able to do it. But the question really becomes, how do we share that information amongst the larger teams that we work with and the other people who help support us? So one of the questions I want to throw out to you right now is, what are you doing to help ensure that the rest of your groups and groups that work around you actually understand what your team can and cannot do. And I will call if nobody raises their hand. Nobody? So, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So does your team talk to faculty members about their services and what they're able to do? Yeah, I, w I would say so. And how are those conversations facilitated? One-on-ones. Um, One-on-ones. We do WebEx. Mm-hmm. So have you ever brought in your faculty together to kind of look at what are they able to expect from your IT team? We have a Department of Online Learning and Teaching. They host um, sessions quite often. OK. How else are you guys doing it? Yes. He's going to bring you a mic, actually, because we're streaming. So they want to capture all the questions. What we do is some meetings to to see the teacher and the student necessities, mm -hmm. and that works a lot because uh, we tried as IT mm -hmm. to cover all the necessities for the teacher. So sometimes they have they they have a problem that can be solved quickly, and they don't know how to do it with the IT, mm -hmm. but sometimes you have to develop something to cover the, the necessity. The necessities, yeah. 
So a lot of times you're hearing people that are reaching out and having communications through other groups. How many times are your IT groups actually going out specifically to hold information sessions? Anybody doing anything like that? You are. And what are you doing with your team? No. I so we, we generally, we hold kind of training sessions for our faculty depending on um, what their interest is and so we've worked we have a faculty group that um, does professional development and so we work with them and they may tell us instructionally so we moved to canvas and so we had our inst instructor said we need to get more training on that so we set up some sessions where we would do beginning and intermediate advanced levels of training with them um, and what we what, what we find is that we don't get as much participation so our issue is we we can hold the trainings Mm -hmm. um, but the faculty have busy schedules, sometimes they're out of town, so in terms of how much spread we get with that, in terms of the, the participation, we haven't found a good way to consistently get a good, you know, a, a good number of, of faculty to make it, make it effective. Um, we do one-on-ones as well, that seems to be the best way we've been able to do it. We try going to departmental meetings, those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. But we're still trying to figure out how to do it when we're doing something school-wide. Um, it's, hard, it's hard to drive those kinds of things. And, and so we're still, we're still struggling to figure out the best way to, to reach out to faculty and work with them. So it, it tends to be a common theme that I have heard from IT support staff, instructional design staff, is getting faculty to come to these information sessions. Anybody else having these issues? Yeah, a few hands up in the room. And I think it's really important that we look at not just our team of characters, but how we're teaming with both the deans and the leadership in order to bring in those faculty. Part of your team that you don't really see here on our cast of characters is that higher leadership team and how that leadership makes your support a priority for the institution. Where does it actually sit in the paradigm in terms of ensuring that not just that they've taken the right training, but they're coming and getting the information they need in order to succeed. So we really have to think about how those faculty members and our team interrelate with one another. How do they see each other? You know, we have to have this value for what the teams do. Faculty have an inherent value to the institution. And IT and instructional design and support services have an inherent value. But the titles alone don't bring that respect. And it's how that respect is built through the institution that leadership really needs to work on and think about because we need to explain how somebody has come to the institution, especially if they're not faculty, and make a case for why they need to have this respect, why they're seen as important throughout the institution. It doesn't happen organically. A lot of times faculty support staff are shown in research as the support staff, not even knowing that some of that support staff have higher degrees, have masters, have doctorates, and therefore they're seen very similarly to other staff and lower level staff where if you were to actually put them on a paradigm and have yourself looking at where these people lie in comparison to those faculty members, they can have many times more education and more experience than many of the faculty members coming in. So how is that communicated throughout your groups? I know a lot of times we've started to actually put the CVs of our staff up on our website so that somebody can actually see exactly where did this person go to school? What background do they have? What's their experience? How long have they been working? What publications have they done? What presentations have they done? Anybody else doing anything to promote their staff, to provide, get that respect that is due to them? Any other people here at the university level doing anything? No? You doing anything with your staff? I actually forgot a staff. Oh, okay. Uh-huh. And I see people mm -hmm. at major universities who've adopted our product 
So I was very interested to come and hear your discussion mm -hmm. um, with the primary uh, primary members of Aperio, actually. Okay. So sorry, I can't uh, That's give okay. you hands on there. Who else from a university here? How are you promoting your staff? Or are you not and hadn't even thought about it? How many people here actually have a way to promote their staff members, their support staff? How many people do not? More hands do not than do. Has this even been discussed at your institutions about the promotion of your staff to earn the respect that they need? Yeah. <laughs> The nice delay with the mic. <laughs> We've had faculty even demand occasionally in the past that CVs be posted. Mm -hmm. And sort of as a result of that tone, they haven't been. <laughs> oh. Uh, we're a union shop, and it just didn't wasn't approached in a very good way. Mm -hmm. um, so I have on our website, which I seriously doubt very many people look at, but I have, you know, on a you know different different times it said different things, but I have the list of people and what you know what they've done, and mm -hmm. you know I have a little bit of that, but it's not as transparent as it might be. Mm -hmm. uh, we try to do a lot of that in the one-on-one, -on -one, um, you know, I go to an, an orient, new, new faculty orientation session mm -hmm. in the fall, um, and we have a, a chance to put a little blurb in, and, you know, and we try to, we, we work closely with this new department, which is the Office for the Advancement of Teaching and Learning, um, which Dan mentioned, and that's really been our best way to worm our way <laughs> in. Mm -hmm. we, I mean, we, we, we can't get to faculty meetings. The only times I've ever been successful in going to faculty meetings was, you know, t 30 years ago when the person wow. who at the time was doing um, scheduling mm -hmm. for the departments would give me five of her 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. um, and I was involved at that time with classroom media assistance, which, you know, was a whole other world back then. Um, but I was, you know, then we were able to bring some information so they could learn about how how we were already serving their departments, you know, from a percentage wise and so on. Uh, it's a it, it's a big problem. We've talked about it internally. Mm -hmm. There hasn't been anything institutionally. Mm -hmm. So it just what we try to do is anytime there's a, a there we don't even have one list. I mean, I hate to say this. Uh, but it was like, we don't have one list that we can reach all faculty on. Wow. Um, because there's so many, there's different adjuncts, there's different, you know, there's a lot of things like that. So communication is, I think, part of the big picture that you need to think about in terms of how you're actually gaining that respect for your group. Because if the faculty don't know who you are and who your team is and what they've done, it's going to be a little harder for them to kind of gain that trust with them. And also build up, in a lot of cases, some frustration. So we need to think about how we're actually communicating with our stakeholders, whether they be faculty, your leadership, or even other people in just a generic institution, and how we go about actually bridging that gap. Because that frustration piece when things break is probably the biggest pushback that we get from our institutions in terms of what they're going to actually do and how they're going to react to situations. Because when something breaks, the sky is falling. And Chicken Little is actually running around screaming their head off because the sky is really falling. But they don't know who to go to. And they end up having that greater frustration with the situation in terms of what am I supposed to do? Who am I supposed to go to? How does this happen? Oh my God, it doesn't work. Oh my God, it's broken. <laughs> right? You know, and they're running around and they're running around and you have to remember that there are some easy grenades out there for us to grab and lob over that help reduce that impact, that help reduce that problem 
with us because that communication piece with them about when something's going to go down, who's the point of contact, who can they call when X, Y, or Z happens, where's the documentation on the how-tos of it all, how do I get into my account, is there a guide somewhere? You know, having a website with hundreds and hundreds of guides is great, but how do they find it fast? Because they will tell you, everybody will say they are a very busy person in this world. So what they want is instant access and instant information. So I think a lot of things that have shown in the research is that we're missing kind of that low-hanging fruit, those easy grenades we can lob over to kind of take care of some of the smaller problems that happen, such as having your documentation out there looking at things you can do to reduce the stress load in your community. Because if they have a point of contact, if they have somebody that they've developed a relationship with, there's a better chance that you're going to actually be sure that that faculty member actually talks to the next faculty member or talks to the next person in a positive way about that experience. And I'll be honest with you, it is one bad experience that will spread like lightning fire. You know? I mean, you have that bad experience, that person is going to talk the loudest. They're going to be the most vibrant. But it's all the small good experiences that build up with our group. So, communication. We have to think about how we're communicating with everybody. We need to think about the language we are using. You know, a lot of times, I am an instructional designer, and I work a lot with our IT folks. And very recently, I had somebody talking to me, and he said to me, you know, I don't understand why you don't get this. And I was like, I'm not an IT person. And they were just shocked. They assumed right off the bat. I knew all of this technical information he was giving me. So he was talking to me with that assumption that I had this knowledge that I didn't have. And it's important that we think about how we're communicating and asking questions even about the simplest thing and opening the door for somebody to come to us and stop and go, hold on, I don't get that. Even the simplest of things deserve the stop and touch point of, does that make sense? Am, am I... Am I okay? And looking, teaching our staff and our support groups to look for those verbal cues, those question marks in their eyes. Because a lot of times you'll see people go and it is, go here, go here, go here, go here, do this, do that. Or look over here, and then go over here, and you've just done 15 different steps for somebody. And they're kind of clueless about what just happened. So speaking that same language and having the same approach. I know one person at a school in Pennsylvania that I talk to regularly actually does for every meeting with a new faculty member, and they keep track of all the faculty members they've touched from their IT department. They actually have a list of who's actually been introduced so that there is a formal process when somebody comes to their help desk, to their support team. That's an introduction to, hey, you know, we're going to take a few minutes and talk about our services and kind of give you that one-on-one -on -one orientation you were talking about, but it's formalized. Everybody's speaking the same language, everybody's saying the same thing. It isn't a big question mark and kind of an ad hoc piece to what's going on. Because the consequences of not doing that result in a different message across time and a different input to the faculty member. Well, so-and-so told me I'm supposed to go here, but so-and-so said this, and now you're confused. Now you don't know what to do. So you really have to make sure that everybody understands the same thing and has a basic grounding in what that thing actually is because it doesn't happen organically. Again, I'm going to throw it out to you here. Do you have a process? Anybody have a process here they'd like to share? about how they're communicating with their faculty, how they're setting that up. Yes, sir. He's going to bring you the mic. The gentleman in the burgundy shirt. Hi. At our school, we have um, bi-monthly, excuse me, monthly meetings with our um, faculty trainings team. 
Mm -hmm. um, and that way, so we can communicate with them, and then they actually go out and work with our faculty. Um, and honestly, we've found that that has a great um, impact on our faculty. That we've had better responses from them, mm -hmm. as well as given us the ability to teach the people that are going to be teaching the people what's coming up, mm -hmm. and actually discuss the plan on rolling things out with them. Wow. So it's bi-monthly, you said? Uh, once a month. Once a, once a month. Wow. And so that's all getting communicated and filtered in a consistent message with a consistent theme to all the partners exactly. involved. Wow. And then, so my question is, your leadership supports this idea. Yeah, actually, they, um, it had been something we've been having problems with in the past. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we've been not communicating well enough, or my department hadn't been communicating well enough with the faculty and staff, so they determined that this would be a way of keeping the faculty up to speed. Um, we get invited to their monthly meeting, actually, to present what's going on and discuss options going forward. Um, that honestly helped, again, just create a cohesive and understanding environment. Wow. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. Anybody else like to share how they're communicating? Yes, ma'am, over here in the white sweater. For us, we, we've looked at several different ways because we've always had an issue with emails. They don't read emails. So um, we have a, a portal, a community on our portal that we usually put information on. And um, we also use our LMS announcement section. Uh, additionally, we have a, a campus bulletin, so we kind of get information out in various places. Yeah, and that, that works. Mm -hmm. So how many people actually use email to communicate with their faculty? I see quite a lot of hands. So a push method. We're going to push out the information to the faculty member. Is anybody pulling information from their faculty members, from their stakeholders? Yes, ma'am. He's going to bring you the mic. We create in Sakai uh, with different institutions, sites of communicate with, the, uh, with different tools to make the documentation direct uh, for the problem mm -hmm. and with groups. So that's really great because you have a meeting every 15 days, uh, two weeks, um, but you, you have all the documentations. And with the new tool with Sakai, it's very nice because you have uh, the documentation in, in site, but you have all by mail. Too. So it, it's, it's very easy to, to solve problems and to get new ideas from there. Nice. Yes, ma'am. would say at our institution we have a very small group of people who actually work from the IT directly with faculty concerning the LMS. Mm -hmm. So really there's two or three of us who work very intimately with faculty on a daily basis. In fact, we're embedded in the um, largest classroom space building on campus. So we're right there and faculty know they can just walk in if they have questions and that's helped immensely. But communication wise, we um, we look through the service tickets. I mean, we're always in there answering questions for faculty anyway. So we kind of monitor that. And if we see that there is a subject that comes up, you know, a hot subject that's confusing them more often than not, then that's what we base our communication on that month. You know, we'll shoot out a, a quick little video, a how-to on it. We'll focus on the weekly thing that goes out to everybody from the IT that explains it with a link to something. We just kind of keep our hand on the pulse a little bit of if, if we can see that there's a common problem with Sakai, a confusion, something that in the upgrade that's really seemed to, to confuse people, that's what we focus the communication on that month. I don't think, you know, that's probably all that clever, but um, the fact that we're watching 
our service tickets and kind of watching the conversation happening there and confusion with the help desk or whatever, we kind of focus on that on our communication for the month to month basis. I love that idea because not only is that saying you're being responsive to the larger group who actually use the help desk, and, and by the way, use it appropriately because we know people don't always use the ticketing system and the help desk the way it should be used, but it also shows that you're documenting to your leadership. Well, you know, faculty could be complaining about X feature that doesn't work, but we don't have the help desk tickets to show that. Our help desk team doesn't have that information because they may say it to you, but we don't, we don't have a way to know that. We're not mind readers out there. So I actually think it's extremely clever, and I don't know if you've thought about the documentation piece and giving that to your leadership, but if that's the focus of kind of where your support is going, it's a great way to say, this is how we're prioritizing. This is how we're doing our work. It's very easy. We have service now. It's very easy in this ticket system to run a quick report on which departments have the most problems, what kind of problems they have. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's outstanding. And I would say in our OIT department, which is pretty big, um, they're very proactive in, in running reports out of, t out of service now. So, Yeah, and, you know, the other piece to that is I think it kind of gets, helps me segue to the next slide here, which is this is kind of a never-ending journey we're doing. You know, this isn't going to stop. And so the more you can sit there and think about how you're actually supporting the faculty and showing your leadership those trends, because people don't like change. So Sakai 11, everybody went, where did my cheese go? You know, who moved my cheese and why'd you move it? And oh, it wasn't the right time and oh, it affected this. But in the end, people who are unhappy with the change, who are having problems assimilating with that change, who need support in that change, are probably going to be not the people who are pulling out your help desk tickets, but are going to be the loudest. And so you can help support both those people who do use the system and your leadership by saying, we'd love to hear their concerns. Put in a ticket. Because that's how we prioritize. That's the way we work. And that takes us all the way back to the communication piece. Because once your stakeholders understand how you're compiling that information, how you're getting that information together, they're more likely to use it instead of running around just talking. You know, we, we, do, we have a never-ending journey, and I think we need to realize that as support staff, this doesn't stop. Yes, sir. One of the things that we've done, particularly with our uh, upgrade to Sakai 11, is identify um, well, we have master course templates that we import content into the course teaching shells that are used. And so there's a setup process that uh, every faculty member has to go through to get their course ready to teach. Um, and so we've identified things that faculty members need to know in that course setup process, and we've created a set of videos. And so we had those in a library, but, you know, people weren't watching them. So we're in the process now of actually embedding those videos in every course content that will be moved over in a faculty guide so that they'll be right there. So if they're going to the faculty guide, which they should be to help them figure out how to teach the course, they have those resources right there to be able to um, set up the technology. And so putting the resources where they're going to need them, where they're going to run into the problem to help them be able to find it easily when they encounter that problem. It's a great idea. It's real time, right there, at their hands. And again, you have the documentation to show you're reaching out to the faculty member. I, I can't overemphasize that documentation piece. And the other piece I wanted to talk about in this slide is, you know, faculty members tend to, or your stakeholders, whoever it be, I'm using these words kind of synonymously here, <clears throat> they want something. They come to us. And a lot of times there are things that have to happen beforehand. I see you nodding your head here. <laughs> and for them it sounds like no. Oh, I've got this much paperwork to fill out. Or I have to do <gasps> requirements gathering. Oh, you know, what does that mean? The difference between a need and a want. You know, Sean and I were having that discussion last night at dinner. If I want it, is it a need? How do we communicate to them what it even means to gather requirements? Because all of this sounds like barriers.
to our stakeholders, and they don't understand why. So going back to the next slide, it's part of that communication piece. Why are we doing this? What's the benefit for them in terms of us having this information in place, explaining it instead of giving the list, going through the actual process of educating our stakeholders about why? Why is this necessary? Yeah, I know it sounds like a pain. I'm really sorry. Yep, there's paperwork here, but you know, we all work in our case for the federal government. So there are things we have to do before we can look into this. And yep, it's a lot of paperwork, but it increases your chance of getting to a positive outcome. It is part of the rules of what needs to be done. But I can tell you from a lot of looking at the research out there, people just tend to give them, well, you've got to fill out Form 1432, and then you have to go get a signature from your dean, and then you have to go over here and get a signature from the VP of X, Y, and Z. And that's what they hear, but they don't understand why. What's the purpose of all of this? Why is this in place? And in the end, it comes back to your support staff. Well, they had a ton of paperwork for me to do. They. And you get into those you and they conversations, which aren't positive, which don't promote really a great partnership between both teams. So I got to tell you that I'm a longtime Monty Python fan. Not a surprise. I'm sure there are a lot of you like that in the room here today. Um, so I was a little excited when we talked about this. We're going to do Monty Python is the theme for our conversation about working with faculty in IT and in learning management system delivery. But I was also a little bit concerned when I found out that the Black Knight would be representing my infrastructure team's work. <laughs> I wasn't sure how to feel about that because on the one hand, well, he's, uh, he's vigilant. That's for sure. But at the same time, it's the Black Knight. He's kind of silly. On reflection, though, it's really, you don't watch Monty Python because you're going to learn something every time you watch it. You're watching it for the familiarity, for the jokes you know, because you enjoy spending that time on them. And I think that's how the Black Knight lends itself to being the infrastructure metaphor. Because no matter what you do, you can plan ahead better than anyone. Something's going to go wrong. Sakai will go down in the middle of an exam during the most important exam of the year, despite all your planning, all your load testing, everything else. These things are going to happen. And the big th lesson which we have learned is that you can't lose hope. You need to continue to attempt to persevere. You have to be transparent with your users. You have to tell them why it went wrong. Now, I'll throw myself under the bus. Our Sakai went down in the middle of a summative evaluation. Why? Because we had a login storm at the same time that we had low entropy on the system, and we just exhausted. We couldn't connect to our database. Now we went back and we did our analytics. We'd run 3 million hours of Linux server operations at the university over the past five years. Never had that problem. When does it happen? It happens in the middle of that summative evaluation, because that's just how these things go. And you, all you can do is tell them why it happened and what you're going to do to solve the problem and keep it from happening again in the future. Because if you can't get the trust from them, if you can't be honest and have a conversation about it, we're, we're never going to work well together going forward. And they're always going to look at infrastructure as the Black Knight, the silly limbless guy who's standing on the ground shouting insults at you without any ability to affect things. And that's not where we want to be. We want to be a, a core part of a larger conversation, uh, part of a movie which we all enjoy. Yeah. So, the right, a little rabbit that nobody took seriously. How many people remember this scene from the movie? Yeah. Huh? It's the bunny with the big pointy teeth. There we go. But it's just the bunny, you know? What are we going to do? It's just the bunny. Bunny ain't going to hurt you. I'll go take care of that bunny. <laughs> yeah, well, that bunny is the one that gets you in the behind. It's the one that causes the most havoc. It's the unexpected things that are going to get you. And we're really sitting here trying to say that there are so many things that play into our 
involvement with our core community, with our stakeholders. But don't forget the little unexpected things. The server unexpectedly going down in the middle of a test. Okay? Major assessment goes down. It's part of that partnership. It's part of that previous communication. It's part of that trust that you're building with your stakeholders that's going to help you get through these little unexpected things. Because trust me, if it can break, I break it. Okay? I have an innate ability to have the bunny come up pretty much on a daily, yeah, a daily event in my own personal life. Computer doesn't turn on. No reason. But think about all the faculty members that are coming to you for those unexpected big events. The one-on-ones take care of it. You know, how you communicate with your institution about the big bunnies that are out there or the little ones that take out a core amount of people, how that's communicated, what the resolution is to the problem, what are the next steps that are going to take care of that problem and make it not happen again? What did we do well? You know, Sean's sitting here more than willing to throw himself under the bus. You know, but we have to be able to do that and say there's nothing we can do about it. Life happens. Things happen and they're unexpected. And these are the things we do to make sure this doesn't happen again. We can't promise it's never going to happen again. But what we can actually say is that we have steps in place to help ensure and do our best that it won't. And it's also part of that communication piece. Where is your communication when the bunny comes up and bites everybody? How do you inform the larger group? Where's your leadership informing that group? And how is your leadership actually supporting your team to make sure those bunnies actually get taken care of? Why are decisions made the way they're made? And I'd love to hear if anybody has any methods they're using to ensure the unexpected things result in less havoc. Any ideas on that? Yes, ma'am. So we had a fun experience with a uh, final exam as well a couple years ago. And the uh, professor admittedly set up the worst case scenario for this thing to fail. He had, like, I'm not kidding, like 100 question pools with, you know, 10 questions in each one. He was doing a randomized quiz or a randomized exam. He had a lockdown browser. He had 300 students taking it at the same time. So they simultaneously all logged in at the same time. And everything you do to prepare for it. There's nothing you can do when it when it breaks, and it broke bad. So um, we sat down with him, you know, the next couple days after we got everything figured out, and um, we really put forth the effort then moving forward to work with him very proactively on how we can fix this because there's just so much you can ask of a system. And after that point, for us, we just you know you're beating yourself against your head against the wall. Um, so we worked out some plans for him if he wanted to continue in that style, you know, how to do staggered starts on it, maybe every five minutes have a group of students, whatever. But then going forward, as he tried then two other systems along the course of the next couple of years, we really just stood in the classroom during the exam with him. We just gave him the presence that we were there so that if, you know, wow. 10 students simultaneously stand up with their laptops and move forward going towards him, there were support staff around that could all answer the questions for him. We just basically had a show of force. Mm -hmm. You know, we're here supporting you. If you want to do this, we, we, we don't recommend that you do this, but you're going to do it anyway. So we're here to help you, but we can't take the blame if, if you move forward doing something that we would recommend you not do. But we still wanted to help support him in any way we could. So. That's basically what we did. We, you know the inevitable is going to happen, but if you stand behind them and sh tell them you're at least going to help them, you may not be able to fix it right away, but you'll be able to answer a lot of outlying questions and support them, then I think they really appreciate the fact that you do have their back. Mm -hmm. As IT, we have to do that for them because they can't solve these problems on their own. Mm -hmm. um, if they don't heed our advice, there's not a lot we can do, but at least we're helping him. But you said that to him. Yeah, you said that to him, and I think that's kind of key 
in helping prepare our stakeholders for the results of their actions. We don't recommend you do this. This has a lot of potential pitfalls that will cause you issues, you know? We see the rabbit with the red eyes and the big teeth um, over there. And you need to know that this will have consequences. Because a lot of people are afraid to say that. This could break it. It could break it. People don't say that to their stakeholders. What you're doing has consequences. What you're doing could break it. We're not set up for this. Because we, as support staff, feel like it's our duty to make sure everything works all the time. When in reality, we know what those limitations are. So again, and any other suggestions, ideas that the group would like to share? All righty. Where? There we go. Um, we do something similar in terms of um, just planning for the unexpected. So a lot of times when we sit down with faculty, if they're using technology, what we say is, if this fails, do you have a backup plan just to make sure that they have something? If it's something as simple as having printed off paper copies of the exam so that they can easily um, have those ready. Um, or if we'll have a, a pool of laptops as backup in case one or two students come in and their equipment fails. Um, so those, we do those kinds of things. And then if we know there are kind of, you know, kind of the most inopportune times during a high stakes exam, during those times we do similarly, we do a show of force. So beginning of the term, midterms, finals, we make sure that we have people double check things and we have, we have staff that are, uh, that are available. Um, so that along with, again, kind of just ha having them think about if things don't work, what's your backup plan? Just having them think through that has, has made a big difference. And, and it's, you know, having that communication with your stakeholders as well. When do those things come up? Having that conversation with their leadership about when exactly are these high stakes pieces that you may not even know about that are going on. I mean, some institutions are so large, you don't have that insight if they're not going to talk to you. So developing back that conversation with those stakeholders. Well, thank you very much for sharing today. Um, our contact is up there. And if there are any other questions, we have about a minute or so. All righty, well, thank you very much.